Hey everyone, I'm Patrick Wright, the director of the Center for Executive Succession here in the Darla Moore School of Business at the University of South Carolina. And I want to thank you all for coming uh, and welcome you to the fourth annual Leadership Legacy Award Ceremony. I'll have more to say on this year's winner, Ellen Alamany, the, Alamany, the uh, CEO at CIT. But first, I want to turn uh, the program over to Dean Pete Bruce. Pete? Thank you, Pat, so much for that uh, introduction and welcome everyone. As far as I can tell, we have over 120 registered to attend this event, made up of faculty, staff, students, business executives connected with our Center for Executive Succession, and of course, our honoree this evening. It was only four years ago when we recognized the inaugural winner of this particular award, Mike Lamarch, who was chairman and CEO of Ingersoll Rand. Mike was then followed in 2018 by Liz Smith, who uh, was the CEO at Bloomin Brands. And of course, last year, the third award winner was Ron Williams, who was former chairman and CEO of Aetna. This year, of course, I am delighted to be able to recognize and honor Ellen Alamany, chairwoman and CEO of CIT Group. And Ellen, as you hear, you join an, a real auspicious group of uh, chief executives. And please know that uh, you have to work pretty hard to get this award. And may I say congratulations on a phenomenal career, a great leadership uh, record and I look forward to hearing uh, what you have to say a little bit later on in tonight's uh, um, events. It also serves me to introduce a wonderful guest here this evening who has joined us. And I am delighted to welcome our new mayor. Well, actually, he's not really our new mayor. He's a new visitor to this particular event because I think we've invited him to the other three. And he, he, he has been unable to attend, but Mayor Benjamin, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. What some of you may not know, and for our students, this is most important. Our mayor is a double Gamecock. He did a undergraduate in political science. He got a JD uh, at the law school. In 1990, he was student body president. And that was kind of when he started his legacy of service to our community. What you probably also don't know is his parents actually come from Orange County and they had moved up to the Northeast and he was actually born uh, in New York. Um, I guess that kind of makes you a Yankee, uh, Steve. I, I don't quite know what to do about that, but you have been the most amazing mayor and it has been an absolute honor for me to be in this uh, position and work alongside you. Thank you so much for the amazing things you have done for our city and for the service you have rendered. And you have come to many other events that I've introduced you at, so please don't let our group think that you don't come to events. I must unravel that one a little. But Mr. Mayor, you are so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Well, well Dean, the, uh, the introduction gets better every time. I'm gonna take you with me on the road, man. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that was incredibly, incredibly kind. I am, I'm a Gamecock and I regret all of us not being able to be together in person. So as a result, I wore my garnet jacket uh, to be fully in the spirit uh, for, for today. Uh, it has really been my, my life's pleasure and honor uh, to represent the people of Columbia for the last uh, decade. Uh, it seems like it's, it's flown by uh, and I've had the opportunity to get around uh, the country indeed around the world and extolling the values and virtues of what makes uh, this uh, community special. Uh, I, I love telling people about the incredible fortunes and the successes of the University of South Carolina, of the Moore School, and the incredible education uh, that our, our, our young leaders uh, of today and the future receive there. Amazing business school um, uh, with uh, obviously the very best uh, international business program in the, in the world. I love telling the way the state government, we've been that since March 17, 1786, and, and the culture that that helps create here. And obviously, that Fort Jackson, uh, we, we train the majority of the, of the world's soldiers here. We've created this microcosm of society because of those three forces, uh, where we have people from nearly every one of the 194 sovereign nations of the world who speak 90 languages. It's a wonderful community in which to live, work, play, and prosper. And I love telling people what happens when you leave campus, when you leave post, when you leave the vaunted halls of our state capitol, you meet the people that make Columbia very special. 
Ohio, you still find people who, who actually pull over for funerals, um, that you find people very thankful for the many blessings in their, in their lives, uh, that you can still find sweet tea in, in restaurants, uh, and that you, that you meet people who know the two most powerful words in the English language, and those are simply thank you, thank you. Um, and, and I appreciate being uh, uh, invited here today because I had a chance to read um, Ellen Alamany's um, uh, uh, CV, and it's simply amazing, uh, um, uh, the work uh, that she has done. Uh, uh, so this is a, a thank you uh, to Ms. Alamany. It's, uh, first of all, thank you from a, another liberal arts major. Uh, many people often question uh, our, our, our background, but the show and understanding of the phenomena and forces of the universe and to buttress it with a strong MBA and a specialization in finance, and then to go out into the world and displays a trail uh, that would make anyone um, uh, stop and, and take notice while uh, making sure your company had been incredibly successful and, 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 and profitable. Uh, there's been this true spirit of commitment to, to corporate social responsibility, working to eradicate poverty and build an inclusive uh, economy. Your, your amazing work uh, for the Center for Discovery uh, is, is all just an amazing amount to be uh, proud of and that we're all thankful for. Um, you, you've worked not only to um, produce for the, uh, for the companies that you've led, but you, you've also edified the communities in which uh, So this is just an opportunity I didn't want to miss this uh, chance to say on behalf of the people of Columbia, the home of the University of South Carolina since 1801, a, a, a big thank you uh, on behalf of the people of our great city. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Mayor Benjamin. Uh, I also want to recognize Jim Duffy. Jim is the Chief HR Officer at CIT. Um, I've known Jim for a number of years, uh, and he's one of the founding uh, advisory board members for the Center for Executive Succession, has been a strong proponent of the Center and uh, the master's program in HR. So Jim, just want to say a few words? Thank you, Pat. For, first, as a New Yorker, uh, I, I'd like to uh, tell Mayor Benjamin that uh, we'd be happy to claim, as, claim him as our own. Um, and uh, as, as to the center, uh, being intimately involved, I, I know all too well what the mission of the center is and the objective of the award. And, and I can say from up close and personal that um, I, I don't think that there's, there's likely to be a more deserving recipient of the award than, than Ellen. And, um, and uh, I get to live that every day. But I also tell those in HR that if they ever partner with an HR focused CEO, hang on your shorts. Okay, so with that, thanks Jim. Um, for those of you that don't know, let me tell you a little bit about the Center for Executive Succession. Uh, it was founded with the mission of being the objective source of knowledge regarding the issues, challenges, and best practices with regard to C-suite succession. And by objective, what I mean is that a lot of people that do research in this area are either consulting firms or executive search firms uh, who tend to have, uh, let's say, research that might have an agenda aimed towards a practice or towards uh, gathering some type of consulting or search fees. And so what we wanted the center to be was um, the one kind of academic outpost where uh, we just do research to, to learn, to uh, contribute to the field of knowledge, to help organizations to be better at how they make, make succession decisions, and to do so in a way where we don't charge anything, we don't uh, do consulting, we don't charge anything for other than our partners uh, as part of an annual partnership in, in uh, funding the research. In 2016, we created the Leadership Legacy Award and have been honored to recognize, as Pete mentioned, uh, CEOs such as Mike Lamock of Ingersoll Rand, which is now Train Technologies, Liz Smith at Blumen Brands, and Ron Williams, the former CEO of Aetna. And this year, um, as I've said, we're really excited to recognize Ellen Alamani, uh, Chairwoman and CEO of CIT Group, and Chairwoman and C CEO of CIT Bank. The Leadership Legacy Award seeks to honor CEOs who have, dis who have displayed a personal commitment to building leadership talent in the organization while driving successful financial, social, and reputational performance. And we emphasize personal commitment because we recognize that in many companies on lists like the best companies for leaders, the CEO's role may only be to sign a budget line approving the spending on leadership development programs or occasionally talking about the importance of leaders, 
yet they do not invest their own time and energy in building the pool of leadership talent. This award recognizes those who view building leadership talent as a critical part of their role as CEO and at the same time deliver great results for shareholders, customers, and society. And this is why Ellen is so deserving of this. So since joining CIT as a chairwoman and CEO in 2016, Ellen has led an enterprise-wide strategic transformation of the company by establishing a clear and decisive plan to exit non-core divisions, grow its core divisions, convert from a financial services model to a bank-funded business model, and doing so, all, all doing so while creating substantial value for shareholders. Ellen's delivered this strategic transformation by, by prioritizing talent and culture. Some of her key accomplishments included building a diverse board of directors that's one-third women and one-third people of color, which our research shows is extremely unique. Establishing a diverse leadership team with approximately 40% of her direct reports being women. Building a diverse leadership team deeper in the organization with the female heads of technology, operations, treasury, retail banking, aviation lending, and financial planning. Establishing a diversity and inclusion program called BU that delivers employee engagement, talent, community and supplier programs to drive a culture of inclusion and enable employees to bring their best selves to work. Establishing company-wide core values that are part of the company's performance process and recognition programs supporting the idea that how leaders deliver is as important as what they deliver. And finally, creating a stronger connection between employees and the community through volunteer programs like CIT Cares and charitable matching funds. Now, that all sounds like a CHRO's dream, but as Jim referred to there, he tells me that after working with Ellen, he warns other CHROs to be careful what you wish for. When a CEO is that committed to talent, the demands on the CHRO increase exp exponentially. Now, I will say that one of the things that, that, that Jim points to about Ellen's uh, you know, being such a great talent magnet, as he said, that uh, he could actually quantify her impact on talent by showing that uh, she has attracted most of the leadership team around her without having to use executive search firms, which is an extremely expensive proposition. So because of her uh, leadership style and, and leadership ability, people want to work for her and want to work at CIT. And that has allowed them to, to uh, attract the, the best talent while not having to uh, hire a bunch of search firms. So finally, under Ellen's leadership, CIT has consistently delivered on its goals to customers, colleagues, and shareholders. This is exemplified by the fact that CIT was named to the Forbes best mid-sized companies to work for three years in a row and was named as a best place to work for LGBTQ by the Human Rights Campaign in 2020. Ellen's not only a leader, she's also a trailblazer and in 2019 was recognized as America Banker's second most powerful woman in banking. Thus, I'm delighted to recognize Ellen Alemany as the winner of the 2019-2020 Center for Executive Succession Leadership Legacy Award. The award comes with a $10,000 gift to the ch charity of her choice, and she has asked that that gift go to the Center for Discovery. So Ellen, thank you so much, and let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Pat. For, oh, I love the uh, screen picture that you have with your dogs. <laughs> but thank you, Pat and Peter and uh, Mayor Benjamin. And, and I want to second what Jim Duffy said, Mayor. We could really use you in New York. <laughs> but uh, I'm really honored and humbled to be here today and accept the uh, Leadership Legacy Award. Um, this is the award. I received it uh, last Friday. Uh, it's really beautiful. It, to Ellen R. Alemany for demonstrating a profound commitment to developing future organizational leadership while delivering superior financial, social, and reputational performance. And uh, I also want to thank the Center for Executive Succession and the University of South Carolina Darla Moore School of Business. So I guess after about 40 years in banking, you start to get awards with uh, the word legacy in them. <laughs> All kidding aside, though, this recognition is really special to me because it captures the many facets of leadership. 
Business strategy and performance are certainly core to effective leadership, but equally important are assembling the best talent and driving the right culture. A strong leadership pipeline must go beyond just getting people with the right operational skill set, as so much more is expected of leaders today than just the ability to perform the tasks of the job. Leaders have to be cultural ambassadors that can drive the right behaviors. They need to advance inclusion and equity and create a feeling of purpose for stakeholders. It's been my privilege to lead CIT for the last five years and some of the best moments that I've had here have been working with Jim Duffy to build a strong and diverse management team. This team can tackle almost any challenge put in front of them and most importantly, do it in a way that aligns with our values. And those shared values are so important, especially during dynamic times such as these. It's the glue that holds it together during times when we actually have to remain apart. Certainly during my career tenure, I've experienced up and downs of all kinds, but what we're experiencing in 2020 is a whole new set of challenges for leaders to navigate. A global pandemic that threatens the health and safety of employees and the continuity of business. An economic disruption affecting customers, companies, and communities. And broad-based social unrest around issues of race, gender, and equity. And all of this is above and beyond the more typical issues that a leader must face. Things like business strategy, financial performance, and human capital. In times such as these, resilient leadership is vital. I'm often asked for advice on creating a long tenured career path, but if I had to boil it down, it's about resilience. For me, resilience comes from the agility to adapt to changing circumstances, the endurance to persevere, and the ability to inspire others to strive for a greater sense of purpose. First, let me touch on agility, which is so important in this environment. Successful leaders must know how to adapt and not be afraid to change course. The business climate changes quickly and leaders need to be in a mode of constantly monitoring the environment and making thoughtful adjustments when needed. Companies that structure their processes, teams, and culture with the ability to be agile and opportunistic will be able to capture greater success but that takes the right leaders to help drive that behavior. The pandemic has clearly tested the bounds of agility in many ways. In March of this year, we had to make a really quick decision to go from an office-based workplace to a largely remote working model across the country, while still ensuring that our operations continued uninterrupted. Our spirit of agility allowed us to adapt to the changing circumstances to protect our employees, serve our customers, and support our communities during this time of great change and uncertainty. Also, essentially in, also essential in creating resilient leadership is endurance. A vibrant career is a marathon, not a sprint. There's gonna be great victories and also great disappointments. Resilient leaders do not give up, but rather find ways to adjust, power through, and persevere. Endurance is vital in pursuing great achievements, and that takes giving of your head, your heart, and time. If there's one piece of advice I would give young leaders, it's to endure, persevere, and don't give up on your goals. Lastly, you can't underestimate the role of a higher purpose in creating resilient leadership and successful culture. Business can and should be a force for good. And that requires doing good for customers, doing good for employees, and doing good for communities. In my experience, when your customers are satisfied, your colleagues are engaged, and your community is strong, your business will thrive. 
doing good is not only the right thing to do, but it's also what others expect of leaders today. From customers to employees to investors, people want to know how a company is responding to social needs, sustainability concerns, and governance practices. That sense of purpose can mean ensuring your products and practices do right by the customer. It can mean ensuring your employees come to work in a safe and inclusive culture with opportunities to positively contribute and be rewarded. It can mean giving of your time and talents to the community around you. And it can mean helping the community thrive by supporting the business and the people in it. There are so many ways for business to be a force for good, but it needs to start with individuals and leaders that set the tone and create the culture to support it. When leaders can unlock that potential in people and sense of higher purpose in your culture, the outcomes could be amazing. The innovation, inclusion, and collaboration will thrive. I wanna thank the Center for Executive Succession and commend the great work you do to advance the thinking on leadership and human capital. Developing leaders and a pipeline of talent is one of the most important jobs of a chief executive officer. It's been my privilege to work with great leaders and develop many along the way. It's really the people that are with you on a journey that make the journey. To our future leaders in the audience, I encourage you to embrace a spirit of agility, develop the fortitude to endure the ups and downs, and strive for opportunities that tap into your skills as well as your sense of purpose. It will allow you to be a more resilient leader and create that opportunity for others around you. Thank you again. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back to Patrick and, and open it up for questions. Thank you, Ellen. I appreciate that. Um, we have some student questions that will be coming in and uh, Corey is going to be letting people in to uh, un unmute and show their video. And the first question will come from Lauren Rothermel. All of these students are second year students in the master's in HR program. Um, so Lauren, if you're able to. Well, first and foremost, Ellen, congrats on winning the Leadership Legacy Award. It is truly deserved. My name is Lauren Rothermel, and as Pat said, I'm a second year in the MHR program at the University of South Carolina. And you spoke a little bit about endurance and perseverance. And I'm curious, as a female in a traditionally male-dominated industry, what roadblocks did you encounter as you were rising through the ranks? And how did you manage to overcome those obstacles to make your way to become the CEO of CIT Group and one of the most powerful women in banking? Uh, thank you so much for that question, Lauren. And I would say that um, I, I didn't feel I had many roadblocks early on in my career. Uh, and I think the reason is, and, and now when I look back and reflect early on in my career, is that I had a lot of great sponsors. Um, when I joined Chase Manhattan Bank, uh, you know, it, it was a year out of college. I started out in bank operations. One day my boss said to me, if I'm really serious about banking, would I consider going through the credit training program at Chase? Uh, I had started my MBA at night while I was working. Um, I had never, you know, even heard of the credit training program. And, you know, he guided me that way. Uh, and uh, I would say at other points in my uh, career, uh, when I, um, uh, for example, when I was running Corporate Bank North America um, and I was uh, for Citibank, um, my boss said to me one day, would I consider running uh, Canada? And at the time, Canada was going through a financial crisis and I you know, just thought, oh, this would be one more headache to deal with. Um, and he said to me, listen, you're not mobile, you know, with your family and children, this will give you an opportunity to really uh, learn how another country works, different regulators, same language, but a different culture, et cetera. And I wound up taking that position. And then, you know, two years later, uh, was transferred to run um, 
uh, corporate banking for all of Western Europe in 18 countries. And had I not had that experience, I wouldn't have been prepared for that job. So when I look back on my career, I had a lot of great sponsors. Um, but when the bank did ask me to move to Europe and I would be having 18 countries report to me and I was the only female uh, in the, the leadership group for Citibank Europe, um, the person who asked me to go, I said to him, you know, how are they going to feel about uh, a woman running, you know, Western Europe? And he just looked at me and he said, don't think about it, <laughs> which was really one of the best pieces uh, of advice. Um, I would say that even, even in this role today, um, I do sometimes feel a little uh, pushback being a woman. And it's just things that people will say that I think, you know, I, I've, I've actually said to a couple of my board members, um, would you have said that to my uh, predecessor? Um, you know, it'd be like, oh, poor Ellen, you're working too hard or, you know, just comments like that, that people will just associate with being a woman. And I've really just pushed back on it, uh, ignored it and powered on. And, you know, I grew up uh, sandwiched between two brothers. <laughs> I think that's uh, helped me. Um, but it's really, uh, I've said to women sometimes, uh, almost behave more like a man at work. Uh, you know, I find that men are much more aggressive. Uh, you know, men are the first in the, my office asking for raises and promotion. You know, women, uh, you know, they, they, there's the expression that say, uh, women, uh, men get promoted on potential, women get promoted on performance. Uh, I do think it's true because men are out there all the time boasting about uh, their performance and what they can do. So but but just push back. Excellent advice. Thank you. Great. Thanks. I'll get the next question. We'll be coming from Brandon Williams. Brandon. I would like to first echo um, Lauren's sentiments and congratulate you on your reception of the Leadership Legacy Award. Um, my question is, you've worked at, in a senior role at Royal Bank of Scotland and Citigroup before joining CIT. So what has been the most discernible difference between those roles and becoming CEO and chair at CIT? I think that um, really the main difference here is at CIT, I report to the board and, you know, the buck really starts and ends with me uh, in the company. And I think all of my roles, though, at Citi and Royal Bank of Scotland really prepared me for this role. And again, I didn't really, you know, it wasn't a plan, you know, I didn't, I didn't think back 40 years ago, gee, I'm going to be CEO or chair of a company and this is the roadmap that I need to do to get there. But when I look back, I did have a lot of different experiences. Um, and I think one of the, the biggest experiences was I had a lot of lateral moves in my career and you know, all of you shouldn't just think about going straight up to the top, that you need different experiences to help you shape your, um, to, to help you shape your um, views. And uh, I had line jobs, I had staff jobs, um, I had international experience, uh, I had different cultural experiences. Um, when I had responsibility for 18 countries in Western Europe, when I worked and reported to, you know, my boss at Royal Bank of Scotland, who actually sat, sat in Scotland and to understand those nuances and develop a lot of cultural sensitivity um, that really helped me prepare me for this position. And uh, while I was working, you know, at Citibank, we, we would joke around and say, when you work for these large organizations, you you're exposed to so many different challenges and problems and you watch how people approach it and solve it. Uh, and even sitting on a couple of public boards, uh, watching those other CEOs in action and how they approach problems, I think all of that prepared me uh, for this role. And so when I raised my hand for this role, I did feel that I had a lot of, that it was through all these different experiences that would help me succeed in this role. Great. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Okay, the next question is uh, coming from Nicole Bartuk. Nicole? Hi, congratulations, Ellen. 
And sorry, I'm wearing a mask right now. I actually have a broken nose. So this is kind of my mask to hide that. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, but I just had a question for you. So many people long to reach retirement, especially in early retirement, if they are financially able to do so. However, you had a drive and passion like no other person. So why did you come out of early retirement for the CEO position at CIT Group? Other than being uh, having strong ties as a board member for two years, where was the heart of your passion at? Thank you. And um, I, one is I hope your nose is better. Um, and I really, I, I, this was probably my favorite question when I, I looked at some of these questions on the, the sheet. And it's funny because when the CIT board interviewed me for this role, there was only one board member, Bill Freeman, who actually asked me this question. Um, which is why are you coming out of retirement to do this uh, this job? I was um, I was 58 when I retired from RBS Citizens, and um, I ran the bank through the financial crisis, and it was a really challenging uh, situation. Um, you know, RBS almost didn't make it uh, during the financial crisis. Uh, they had a lot of regulatory issues. I commuted from New York to Rhode Island for uh, six years. And I was, you know, I was very close to being burnt out uh, in, in the role, you know, just really tired saying, that's it, I'm done. Um, and what I didn't really do is think about life afterwards. Uh, but after I retired, I thought I would put together a portfolio of boards. Uh, I went, I had been on the board of ADP, which is human capital. Um, I went on the board of FIS, which is financial infrastructure, and then I went on the board of CIT, which is commercial finance. And, you know, it was a nice portfolio, you know, that I felt I could add a lot of value. And when I was on the board of CIT, I would literally sit through the meetings and CIT was in the process of acquiring a bank. And, I, you know, I would just say to myself, wow, if I was running the company, this is what I would do or that would do. And the management team kept pulling me in on projects. Uh, and then John Thane, who was running the company at the time, announced that he was retiring. And a few of the board members looked at me and said, you know, would you be interested in the role? And, you know, I went home and I talked about it with my husband and, and my children. And, you know, they're, they're, it was easy for them. They just said, you're much happier working than being at home. <laughs> um, but, you know, one is that I missed, uh, I missed the collegiality. I missed the intellectual stim stim stimulation. And I thought, you know, I saw, saw the shareholder value and I felt that I had so much more that I could offer, you know, based on all the years that I spent in banking. Uh, I wanted to pay it forward. Um, I felt that I could really make a difference uh, in the role. And my, you know, we were now empty nest. Um, my husband took a judgeship, which was kind of a, a dream for him. It was a, a four year judgeship, which by the way, he was just renominated uh, last week and he has another four years. <laughs> so, um, and, and by the way, it's just been, it's probably been the best uh, five years of my career uh, building you know, doing this transformation at CIT. So thank you for asking that question. Thank you so much. But I also want to say is I have, you know, when I say this all the time, I have that gene. And there's that competitive gene that, you know, you want to keep, you know, and some people, you know, have it. I come from a line of strong women in my family. My mother worked until her late 80s. My grandmother worked, you know, which was untraditional at the time. And, uh, you know, I really enjoy what I do. Thanks. So um, the next question is uh, going to be coming from Pranit Upadhyaya, but uh, this is one of the good things. We can always complain about how the COVID pandemic has changed our working styles and um, separated us. But uh, Pranit is from India, was uh, had to come here last year to do the first year of classes and leave his family in India. And so with the COVID uh, pandemic, he's been able to stay in India this semester and finish all of his classes virtually, uh, staying with his family and helping out with his kids. So um, kind of, a, the, there are, are always those silver linings to the COVID cloud. So Pranit. Thank you, Professor Wright. Um, very good evening, Ms. Alamani. I hope you are able to hear me. Thank you. Hi, Pranit. 
I'm, uh, so firstly, many congratulations on the recognition. Um, my question, your life, both personal and professional, is an inspiration to many. Um, you know, in this pandemic, when just about everything is being re-strategized, redesigned, restructured, and our children and their future remain at the core of it all. Um, so taking a leave out of your personal story, um, what are the life lessons that you would like to share with all of us by virtue of being a parent um, to Ellen and your association with Center for Discovery? I would say that probably it's been maybe empathy and trust for employees. Uh, so, you know, it's family first. Uh, you know, we come to work every day, and, and I think a lot of people in corporate America forget that. Um, and I've learned a lot through, through my family, through having a disabled child, um, through having two other children, um, but that it's, uh, you know, it's a give and take. Uh, you know, early on in my career, I left, I left Chase Manhattan Bank because, you know, I gave birth to a handicapped daughter and I needed time to be in, uh, you know, infant stimulation programs and everything with her. And, you know, and back in those days, nobody talked about work-life balance. It was, uh, it was something that, you know, you just, uh, you just didn't talk about at all. And I wound up at Citibank because one of my friends who had worked at, with me at Chase, who had gone to Citi, knew I had this personal situation. And he said, listen, I know you need this time. If you come work for me, I'll give you, you know, three mornings off a week so you can do this with your daughter. Um, and, and, that's, and, and, I, and that's why I left um, Chase to go work at Citibank because I was able to have that flexibility. It's given me the ability to adapt and change. Uh, and I think leaders have to be really open-minded. Um, and I've, you know, even I ran the bank through the financial crisis, now running the bank through the pandemic. You know, I used to be big on line of sight. You know, I watch my children. They work 24 by 7, even though they're not in the office because they love their jobs and they're dedicated to it. And, and our employees are doing the same. They're afraid. Um, the most important thing for them is to protect their families right now. Um, you know, have a paycheck to support their families. And we're building, I think we're building a lot of great will with our employees because we trust them. They're delivering for us. And I think they'll always remember this and they'll build a lot of loyalty. Uh, and as a company, I think we're doing a lot to support our communities through this pandemic. Uh, and I think our customers, uh, you know, supporting our customers. We were one of the, uh, we, you know, we put together the PPP program, uh, which was the government support to support our customers. I think our customers are going to remember that, uh, that we were there for them uh, during this uh, crisis. Uh, I think the second thing is about communication and listening as well. Um, and, you know, when you go through a crisis like this, it's really important to be visible with employees, communicate with them. And, you know, I'm really fortunate with, you know, having people like Jim Duffy and, and Gina Proya, um, who is, who's on the phone tonight, who runs our marketing and communication. You know, we've been out there with our employees almost every other week during this, just, just talk, you know, doing a conference call with all of our employees. Uh, we have roughly 4,500 employees and we must get at least 3,000 people calling in for these calls. And, you know, it's just hearing my voice, uh, knowing everything's fine, giving them an update on what's happening. And then, you know, we'll, Gina will do Q&A at the end and, and we'll uh, have some of our uh, executive management uh, employees just share things. Uh, we'll have, you know, people will see pictures of your dogs or, you know, your living room or family members because we want to show employees that we're, we're human. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's really important. I think authentic leadership is more and more, it becoming more and more important. And early on in my career, I didn't want to talk about, you know, having a handicapped child. You know, I thought that that was a sign of weakness. Uh, and as I matured as a leader, you know, realized that by opening up and talking about it, 
you could relate a lot uh, with relate to employees and it's important for employees to know that you are human and that you are balanced and I can't tell you how many private you know emails people have sent to me sharing that you know everybody has some type of cross to bear in their life you know and sharing those uh, issues with you so um, I uh, as I said I think it's a sign of authentic leadership thank you I appreciate you sharing that yeah. thanks Ellen uh, next question from uh, Alejandro Navarsi Alejandro. Uh, congratulations on the award and we really appreciate you answering some of our questions. So mine is currently companies are moving forward to the idea of bringing your full self to work and having conversations that previously were not considered appropriate. Uh, so to what extent should organizations encourage the dialogue on these issues while ensuring that you maintain a company's culture and workplace dynamic? Great. Well, thanks uh, so much for asking that Alejandro. I listen, I think it's a, it's a must do today. Uh, I, I think if you want to be a preferred employer and attract the best people, um, you need to just provide an environment where people can bring their best selves to work. And, uh, you know, we formed a few different networks um, where people could uh, relate, but, you know, it, it's the right thing to do. It's, it's good business. Uh, it reflects your customer base. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we want people to be really comfortable at work and be themselves at work. And uh, we want employees to feel safe. Um, we want them to be able to be uh, authentic. Uh, so, you know, through our diversity and inclusion programs, we, you know, help uh, support that. And um, recently we had a town hall on uh, social justice and we had many employees uh, share their stories on what they've encountered along their journey personally and professionally. I can't tell you how moving it was. Um, you know, we did it as part of one of my biweekly calls uh, and it was chaired by uh, someone that works for Jim Duffy and we had three, three, three employees basically tell their stories. Um, and it was just so powerful um, for the organization uh, and, and to just raise the level uh, of awareness. So we've, um, we've had lots of programming throughout the company. We have, um, you know, we do it for women, for LGBTQ, veterans, other communities. And it just is, the whole concept is bringing diverse perspectives um, to the workforce because, you know, diverse organizations are higher performing organizations. So from our board, through our senior management team all the way down. We're, you know, a very diverse company. Thank you so much. Great. All right, thanks. The next question from uh, Megan McCrary. Megan? Hi, Ellen. Congratulations again. Um, so my question is, as someone who has been recognized for their success in leadership, what are the main skills or competencies that we as future HR leaders and leaders in general should work on? and have those changed during this pandemic or have some become more important to, than others um, during the midst of this global pandemic? Great, Megan, thanks, uh, thanks for asking that question. I, I, I definitely, as I mentioned before, I put agility and resilience uh, probably on top of the list. So, uh, you know, just going into this pandemic, I mean, we really, we had to make, we made a decision, I think it was the last week of February going into the first week of March, uh, really not knowing where this was going to go, deciding that we were going to all work remotely. And we, we were able to figure out every function in our company, with the exception of tellers in the branches and lockbox, we were able to get people working remotely and we did that it was amazing within you know three maybe three weeks of the pandemic uh, starting and and you know we were bold and this is one of the things I love about being you know chair and CEO of, of a company because throughout my career you know there's always things you want to do and there's lots of red tape and bureaucracy or levels of approval etc here it's we sit around the table and we say we want to do something and you know what everybody in that room is empowered to to go get it done all we just have to say is go do it and that's what we did here we said go do it we knew we were going to have to purchase some more um lap uh, you know ipads and, and laptops and we just said to 
person who runs tech, you know, they came and said, this is neat, how much we need to spend. And we just said, go do it. And fortunately we put in those orders early because then there was a shortage on uh, equipment. Um, but it's, you know, it's one of the best things uh, is being able to pivot and be agile uh, during that time. And um, I think uh, a sense of purpose is also really important. And that's more important in today's environment. It's more than just about producing the widget and making the bottom line. It's what, di what difference are you making? Uh, you know, whether it's ESG, you know, what difference you're making in a community. Uh, employees are looking for more than just having a job. Uh, it's, it's having a sense of purpose and, and forming that community. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Next question from uh, Josie Ott. Josie? Hi, Ellen. And again, congratulations. It's very nice to meet you. Uh, my question was uh, about how I read about how a recent 2020 technology and talent survey was conducted on behalf of CIT Group. And the survey suggested more small and medium sized companies are investing in new technology. So, how does the CIT Group? Um, plan to respond to these findings and how could this impact the company? Sure, um, that was our, I believe our tech and talent uh, survey and that's really about what businesses continue to tell us um, is that, you know, investing in technology is key uh, for their company. And I, you know, we, we have been, um, you know, one is the example I used during the pandemic is, you know, this ability to shift and work remotely as quickly as possible and being agile. Um, I think in that survey, you know, it really talked about the fact that a lot of small and mid-sized businesses really didn't know how to or couldn't make that shift. And they were really ca caught unprepared and off guard for it. Um, you know, we, in financial services, we've been really working on digitizing the business as much, you know, every opportunity we have, um, we're looking to digitize the business um, as much as, as possible. And, um, you know, I think it's also pr uh, providing a work environment where people can develop quickly, um, you know, getting teams of people and project management teams to work on projects so that you can, uh, you can uh, quickly adapt to changes uh, in technology and then also making sure that people have the right tools, the right skill sets, you know, and when you hire, you know, you're hiring for people with digital uh, expertise. Okay, and we'll probably have time for two more questions, but uh, before we go on to Christy Hill's question, I do want to remind everyone that at the end of this, we're going to have a toast for Ellen. So um, if you want to, uh, find a beverage of choice to toast her for this. Um, now would be a good time to find that. And also at the end, when we do that toast, we'll ask you to uh, turn on your cameras at that point and uh, Corey will unmute your camera so that we can go in gallery view and Ellen will be able to see everyone toasting her. So uh, with that as a warning, um, Christy, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Ellen, thank you so much for being here. And congratulations again. Um, so having been recognized for your stellar leadership, what advice do you have for new and future leaders in the midst of this global pandemic while navigating the changes that will even stay afterwards once the pandemic is in the past? Pandemic or not, I, I think that my biggest piece of advice is really res resilience. You know, I can't tell you how many times during my career I was ready to just throw in the towel. You know, you're either working for someone that, you know, you're, you don't really respect or, uh, you know, you, you're moved, you're in a department where it may not be, a, it's more, it's not a great work environment, whatever. Um, but I would just say, just stick to it. Um, and, you know, I, I say this, I'm having these conversations with, with my son right now, who's 27, who, you know, has a lot of ups and downs in his job. And, you know, I'm like, you just put, you know, think about the positives, think about all your learning, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the road to the top isn't straight up, you know, you're going to have, it's a zigzag. Um, think about the experiences and what you learn. Think about the people that you're working with. Um, take advantage of every single learning opportunity. 
um, you know, I grew up with very moderate means. Um, you know, the bank paid for me to get my MBA. The bank paid for me to, you know, go through the credit training program. Uh, you know, every course, e extra leadership course or whatever, I would sign up for it. Um, don't be afraid for feedback. I mean, it's really hard, you know, when people criticize you and or say, you know, when you do 360 feedback and, you know, you take a deep breath um, to see, you know, those responses on a piece of paper. But if you want to get better, um, you need to know what you work on. And I mean, I still carry around in my wallet a little piece of paper and it's kind of like the my five, I call it derailers. Um, and, you know, things I need to watch out for, tendencies that I may have that are you know, could be negative for my team. And I have to remind myself, um, but, you know, at every single level, I am still learning every single day in the job. Um, I ask a lot of questions. Um, I, I want to learn. I want to be better. Uh, I'm, I try to be open-minded. I try to listen to different views and you know, one of the things is when the more senior you get in the organization, the more there are people who just kind of think they, you know, they should tell you what they think you want to hear as to what you really want to hear. And so it's really important to kind of go down in the organization or find people that you trust that will really tell you the truth. Because if you want to be better, um, you really need to know what's really going on. So um, I would just say to, to, be re to try to be really open, um, to try to be a continual learner uh, throughout your career and really think about the jobs um, and what it has to offer you. You know, it's not just about the money and it's not just about the promotion. It's about what you're getting uh, as part of it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. The last question from Ryan Lewis. Ryan. Hi, Ellen. Uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us today and congratulations again um, on receiving this award. Um, on behalf of future HR and business leaders, um, as you look back on your career uh, and the awards that you've received, what advice would you give to somebody starting their career with some high aspirations? Anything is possible. And as I said, you know, from a girl growing up in the Bronx, you know, my father had a small business. My mother was a stay at home mom until she was 50. Um, I was the first person in my family to go to college as you know, I never aspired to do this and uh, to become, you know, chair and CEO of a, a top uh, 40 financial institution is that, you know, it can happen. Uh, and so just stick with your dream work hard, you know, you're going to have some setbacks along the way. Um, but, you know, but it's the great part about the American dream. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thanks. And uh, it's about that time. Um, so we all hopefully have our, I've got my Center for Executive Succession glass ready to go. Um, all of you out there, if you can, please uh, turn on your cameras if you're visible and uh, presentable sure. as you are. And thank you for sending this wonderful bottle of wine. Yeah. And so um, with, with that, I do, uh, normally we have a reception after the talk and all of you get a chance to meet uh, with the speaker, uh, you know, kind of one-on-one -on -one or in small groups as we're having, um, having uh, alcoholic beverages or not. And this time we couldn't do that, so we thought we'd do the next best thing, and that is to be able to do a virtual toast. So um, to Ellen Alamani, the winner of the 2020 Center for Executive Succession Leadership Legacy Award, congratulations, and thank you for all of your contributions to the field. Thank you, everyone. And Pat, I, I don't know if you can hear me. I can't unlock my uh, video because Corey turned me off. Um, <laughs> because there's a message in there somewhere. Thank you very much, Ellen, and congratulations on an amazing career, and thank you for giving such a wonderful uh, education to our students. Um, I think it's the most important thing we all do is to build for tomorrow, and I can't think of a better way to do it than to have a conversation like you've just had with our MHR students and others, so thank you, and cheers. You know thank I'm you, here. and hopefully I'll get down to the school after the pandemic's over. Love yeah, to meet you in person. Yeah.
So, and before okay. we close, I do need to make a few thank yous. Um, first, we keep hearing about Corey. Um, I've got to thank Corey Jones, who um, put all of this together, has run the technology, has uh, just been fantastic in organizing this event. So, Corey, this, thank you. I'll toast you as well. Um, Tina Poindexter on our side also was really helpful in uh, working out some of the bugs and giving, uh, giving us some guidance on how to run this. Um, also, you know, obviously, uh, Pete and Mayor Benjamin, we appreciate you. We know how busy you are and we appreciate your time. And then on the CIT side, uh, Gina uh, that uh, Ellen mentioned has also been helpful in coordinating a lot of the event. Uh, Jim, thanks so much for uh, bringing Ellen to our attention and being part of this event. And especially Ellen, uh, you know, as, as, a, as chair and CEO of a big organization like this, we know how valuable your time is. And we really do uh, cannot thank you enough for uh, spending time with us today and sharing your thoughts with our students. So thank, thank you in particular. Thank you so much. Right. Cheers, everyone. Yes. Great. Here's a, as we're closing, you'll see a number of comments in the chat. Uh, so again, thanks, thanks to everyone. Everybody have a great and, and, and safe evening.